Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Your co-hosts, Jamie Albright and Sarah Rosette, couldn't be more different. In fact, they're a study in contrasts. However, despite all of their differences, they agree that sharing what they wish they'd known, both the good and the bad, is the key to moving forward. Let's get to the show. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. So how are you, Jamie? I'm good. I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) What are you doing this week? Uh, my book is going to the developmental editor next Tuesday. Well, actually today is, I mean, we're recording this <laughs> like in the future on the today. 17th. Yeah. In the future. <laughs> in the, oh, the 17th. So come hell or high water. That book is going to, uh, the developmental editor. So that's what so, I'm doing. That's good. I know you'll be relieved. Yes. Yes, I will be. <laughs> just to not have anything to do on it for two weeks kind of yes. just gives me, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. But what you've got tons of information. I mean, your life's way more exciting than mine. Well, this week it has been. Normally it's like nothing's going on. I'm <laughs> writing. But, uh, yeah, I'm back from London, and uh, that was a lot of fun. We went, even though the virus thing is going on, and everything seemed pretty normal there actually. So, um, my, I was, I told my husband, I said, my hands have never been so clean or so dry. I've been washing them so much, (laughs) but it was a good time. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So I did a bunch of like looking at stuff around London for my books, like places that I write about. I went Uh to visit like the Savoy and walked all over Mayfair and just all the parks there. It rained for two days and then it was beautiful. So that was nice. That's yeah. really great. Yeah. Well, I I also need to apologize to our listeners. Uh, it appears that I am allergic to Houston. So for the last two podcasts, I've really been sniffling, and I'm very sorry about that. Um, ugh, it's gross. So I'm going to try to keep my mic muted when I'm not talking. Uh, so anyway, sorry, guys. That was I noticed it really badly in the David Goggin episode. So. Um, up my allergy medicine and mute my mic. It's, I believe that's the only. The pollen in here is bad. Oh, it's horrible. It's yeah. just like this. It's just like this yellow film on everything. In fact, I got a package from Amazon yesterday and I had to, it probably hadn't been out there an hour mm-hmm. and I had to wipe it off. It was, it was covered in yellow pollen. Yeah. So, yeah. When we got yeah. back at the airport, our car was just like coated yeah. with it. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, sorry about that. But. Well, it's pollen season, so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was also going to say, let's see, I didn't get to go to SPF Live. That was one oh. reason I went there. And yeah. London Book Fair got canceled, which yeah. was yeah. not, you know, unexpected. But um, we had to change our schedule and come back a day early. But I did get to meet some uh, mystery authors the night before and talk with them. Mm-hmm. And that's always good to hang yeah. out and chat that's and talk right. about writing mm-hmm. and publishing. And so mm-hmm. that was a lot of fun. But, but I, I mean, did hear really positive things from yeah. the SPF live show. Um, yeah, I did too. Yeah. And I thought, you know, kudos to them for yeah. putting it together and keeping it going mm-hmm. in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. quite <laughs> impressive. So <laughs> especially for their first event. So I think right. it went really well. And yeah. you can get a digital ticket to it. Yeah. So, oh, um, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So even if you didn't go and you want to hear the speakers, I think you can still get the digital ticket oh, now. Yeah. So if people Good. are interested for that, we can put maybe a link in put there. That in the, yeah, I was going to say maybe put a link in the show notes. Yeah. So we're going to talk to Kirsten Oliphant today, and it was a fun interview. Yes, it was. It was really good. And she's just got so much good information, and she has a great podcast of her own called mm-hmm. Create If Writing. Mm-hmm. And um, we talked about a lot of things that she's talked about on her podcast, and I'll link to those in the show notes, but like we talked about just sustainability, which is very mm-hmm. difficult to say. Mm-hmm. And um, what else do we cover with her? Lots of how those are read, wide ranging how, conversations. Yeah, and how to read success stories, which you know I have posted my success stories before, 
And I try to always, always, always post that what I've made is the gross. It's not what I've spent. It's not my net. Uh, but I do see how sometimes that could not be as encouraging as I think it would be. I mean, I try to always do it with a, a long list of things of what I've done and how, mm -hmm. um, you know, how others, you know, can do yeah. similar You're trying things. to share yeah, details but, about that might help but people. But it made me rethink some things after, after listening to her. So yeah, mm -hmm. no, but so, yeah, it was a good, um, it's a good um, topic to think about because, there yeah. are a lot of success stories now and yeah, they can be are. very encouraging, but they can also be a little depressing too. Sometimes when you right, leave them, right. because if you well, feel I mean, like you you've not all the information. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So we kind of go into those details. And so it was really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I guess we should get to it. Yeah. Let's get to the show. Okay. Kirsten Oliphant writes clean romance, YA paranormal romance, and urban fantasy. She hosts a terrific podcast for writers called Create If Writing and does many, many other things. Hello, Kirsten. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. We're so glad to have you on the podcast today. Yay. We're so happy you're here. I'm excited you guys asked me. I feel really honored. New podcast. I get to be one of the early guests. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, we're excited to talk to you because we feel like you have a lot of good information and you've been in the writing community for a while and working with writers. So we're excited to talk. So um, I checked out your bio and um, one of your bios says um, you wear a lot of hats. So tell us about yourself and some of the hats you wear. Sure. So um, I feel like I'm one of those people who is wearing a lot of hats or standing on like two sides of the fence at the same time. I have my MFA in fiction. So I kind of come from that trad pub, very literary background, and now I'm writing lots of genre fiction and indie publishing. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, but I also kind of in between, like when I finished with my MFA, then we started having kids. And so writing books was really just mentally, I was not able to handle it. So I was doing a lot of other creative work online. So I was doing a lot of blogging and did a lot of teaching and working in the entrepreneur, influencer, blogging, kind of social media space. So I've been teaching and talking about that aspect for a long time. And then, um, you know, as I started writing sweet romance and young adult, paranormal and urban fantasy, kind of applying it to there. So I feel like I understand pretty well the nonfiction and fiction world, as well as a little bit of the traditional publishing and indie as well. Um, so yeah, lots of hats. And uh, I think by the time it's all said and done, I'll probably end up writing in like six genres because I just, I just love writing and story. So yeah. Well, that, that does bring us um, to the next question, which is what was your first big writing success? Because mm -hmm. I know the writing kind of came a little later and you do different genres so, or different sub genres in the same genre. Kind of yeah. Um, gosh, it's so hard to say because I feel like you can measure success in so many different ways. And I like to tell people it's not just about the money. <laughs> it's like, of course, the first thing that comes to mind was like the first big book that um, sold well for me was uh, I think the third full length book that I wrote is called The Billionaire Love Match. And I actually really hated billionaire books and I thought they were ridiculous and they were selling really well. And I was reading them and I was like, I just, I don't get it. I don't like this. I think it's silly. And I started kind of writing a parody of a billionaire book. And then I fell in love with it and was like, okay, it can't really be a parody. Because Sweet Romance, um, I feel like Sweet Clean, I, or that's what I mean by clean. I feel like sometimes authors, well, anyway, there's a lot of debate, but just so we're clear, um, no sex on the page and no cussing. Those readers tend to not have as much of a sense of humor or like the parody might tick them off. Um, <laughs> so I ended up just writing it and fell in love with the characters. And that has been my um, best reviewed, best selling book. And it went from me making you know, a couple hundred dollars a month with my first book and the second book to over four figures and then staying that way. And so that was sort of the first book that I really felt like I got it. And I still made mistakes with that one. Like I changed the cover three times and, and sort of the marketing was a little bit off at first, but it still did really well. Um, you know, and I was pretty excited about seeing, seeing that big jump and then staying up there. Right. And that, that does like sweet romance, clean romance. That is, you got to be careful. I mean, there, there are lines you can't cross. And, um, I mean, you have some wiggle room, but not a ton of wiggle room. Is it, am I right? Or 
Am yeah. I- and I think it's a really interesting audience because you do, um, and it's hard. So here, let me, I'll just say what I mean by these terms, because this is really hard. I know there's a lot of debate about clean because a lot of steamy authors take offense to it. Like it's saying they're work is dirty. I tend to think of it as clean. Like when you think of a manuscript as being clean, if you get it back from an editor, it means there's, it's without mistakes. And so clean to me is like without sex, without (laughs) messing, not dirty. I read steamy stuff too. Um, But because a lot of steamy authors use the term sweet too. But when you're talking about clean, like no sex on the page, those readers are a lot more, I mean, you'll get dinged. You'll have people write in reviews, write low reviews. If you have like one mild cuss word that would be a pg i mean honestly like we're talking under pg 13 like if you were rating the clean romance books by movie standards it's way lower like the line is way far so you do have to be really careful about what's in there um for sure right yeah sounds very similar to um cozy mystery that i yeah i would imagine so Mm -hmm. and there's the same thing about people call them clean books or wholesome or you know so whole debate about the terminology. So, well, um, so it sounds like you kind of fell in love with the, the type of genre as you were writing it. So, um, is there anything that you wish you'd known about writing or craft, um, either about that series or another one? Yeah. So for me, I think coming from the background I do, like the MFA program I went to, like I came out of it and we, so craft is more writing and craft really are very instinctive for me. So that's something I don't teach a lot because it's just one of those things I do. And, you know, like I found a notebook from when I was like in third grade when I wrote my first book um, in like this little notebook. And like, I understood how to do dialogue. I mean, it was terrible, but like I got it cause I read and then it, you know, came through. And so um, the MFA program was the same way. Like when I got out of there, I actually went to a, um, I don't think I told you this, Jamie, but I went with Jamie to a local writers group and we were talking and critiquing and they were using terms and I just nodded along like, yeah, sure. I know what you mean. I was like, I don't know what these words mean. And I have a master's degree. And I was like, I'm just going to keep quiet. I'm just going to be quiet. So I feel like the sort of craft, I mean, and I was, it, that is not to say my MFA program did not prepare me because working with those writers was phenomenal, but there's a real difference in the kind of craft we were doing and what we were talking about and discussing um, on more higher level. Whereas this, you know, I really had to go back and kind of learn some of the terms and some of the things like story arcs, because I would just write it and I can feel when things need to happen. I can feel when it's not working, but I don't always know why. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was more like, I kind of came in assuming like, oh, I know how to write. Like I can write in this genre. I was thinking it would be a lot easier and I really needed to read way more in my genre before I wrote. Like I put out my first two clean romance books having only read like three and I was not reading the right ones. Like I was looking at the clean and wholesome bestseller list and I was picking traditionally published books that were really more chick lit. Mm -hmm. And then I was trying to market my books as clean romance and it wasn't hitting the mark. So I think for me, it was more... Um, realizing that I needed to, I don't, I don't read craft books, but I use them as resources. So when I'm like, why am I stuck? I'll go, I'll like open a chapter of one of those craft books that talks about maybe where I'm stuck. And I'm like, oh, because I didn't do this thing. I didn't know how to name. (laughs) Like I've just (laughs) been doing it. Um, And then just reading, reading books in the genre is so important. So you know what is actually selling and knowing whether you're reading traditional or indie books. So I think Mm -hmm. Looking at an Amazon sales page now, I feel like I go in there and it's like the anatomy of the page, like what picking out the information that's important and making sure I'm actually researching the right way in the right books. Yeah, yeah I found that so, too. So important. And I mean, nothing gets my goat more than um, someone that says, I'm going to write romance, but they've never really read a romance book. That just really gets me. And I think the same is true with sweet romance. You're not respecting the reader. If you don't know what you're, if you do, if you don't know the genre expectations and I just, that's really important. I do remember that meeting and I was kind of impressed that you didn't plot and just wrote this book and they were doing well. And uh, so don't think. So you, you didn't need to know the terms. You were no, fine. you didn't know. <laughs> I'm totally a pantser, like a hundred percent. Um, my, my plotting is very minimal. Like I'll write a paragraph, like here's what the book's going to be. And then I just write it. <laughs> so, lots of surprises, but I, you know, I get stuck and then that's when I have to stop and do those things. But you know, we all work differently. And I think that's mm-hmm. hugely important to figure out about yourself is how you it work is. best. It is. Yeah. So what about marketing? Uh, what do you wish you'd known about it? 
Well, I think, you know, again, coming from, I came in with so many assumptions, like I know how to write because I've got a degree. I know how to market because I've been doing this as a blogger. So I did have a lot of knowledge about how platforms specifically worked. Um, You know, like Facebook, I had been using Facebook pages and groups for years before coming over and starting fiction, you know, working on promoting that way. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like for me, marketing, I think I needed to really know the nuances, kind of like you need to know um, the nuances of the different genres pretty well. Like marketing as a fiction author was a little bit different and some things were easier and some were harder. Um, I found growing an email list was actually easier, which I loved because I'd been teaching email for years and growing an email list as a blogger with a mom blog that was, you know, doing really well. So that, that was helpful. So a lot of those things did translate, but just seeing the different ways that people, um, in, you know, particular genres utilize marketing was, was helpful to know, but I I thought it would all translate. Some of it did and some of it didn't. So I think again, kind of like you research books, you got to research what other successful authors in your space are doing. And it may vary because I know, you know, for, as an example, um, you know, I was talking to someone who writes a specific subset of steamier romance, like then that reverse harem Mm -hmm. area. And, um, I've talked to a couple authors and like their marketing plan is just share in those reader groups. That does not work for clean romance. <laughs> like I've, you know, and I've tested, I've done the parties, I've done the takeovers, I've done the giveaway, no books sold, like maybe a couple, but like those, those authors like, yeah, I don't do any marketing. I just show up in a group and share my link. And then they like, and they, and I'm watching their books. So I know they're selling well. They're not just acting like they are. They actually are selling well. So I think it's really important to know your space in that marketing sense as well. Yeah, that was something I had to learn because I would listen to a podcast and people would say, oh, you like, for example, you need a street team. And I was like, oh, that'd be great. But sometimes that doesn't work. And a lot of times it depends on your genre, the type of readers you have. And, you know, so you can't just do the same, exactly the same thing, get the same results. A lot of times it depends on, you know, your, your readers and your genre. So. And how, how fast you're publishing too. I mean, some of the things that people suggest, I'm publishing a book every month, um, or every two months. And so some of these big launches that people are doing, my readers would be exhausted if I was doing all that <laughs> stuff. And I'd be, you would be too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, that's not sustainable to do like a giant launch and cover reveals for everything. I'm just like, look, here's a cover. <clears throat> here's the book, buy it. Like I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to go yeah. and do this big thing because my books yeah. come out too fast. Yeah. Well, that blends really well into one of the questions we wanted to ask about um, on your, one of your recent podcasts, you talked about sustainability. And so let's talk about that, about how you have kind of come to a place where you've have a little, I don't know. I don't know if I want to say balance because none of us really have good balance in our life. I don't think, but you know, talk to us a little bit about what you discovered about sustainability. Yeah. So balance, man, that's what (laughs) we're always. And you have five kids, right? Yes, I do have five kids. All under the age of. 11 is my oldest. The youngest is three. So it's a, it's a madhouse over here. Um, I feel like I like the word tension for balance a little better, it's a really <laughs> thing, but it feels a bit more like tension. Like balance sounds so peaceful. And it, <laughs> not. I, don't, I don't feel like the process of figuring this out is peaceful and it changes. And that's the thing with either tension or balance, there's this give and take, and it's not always the same. So for me, um, I feel like really the key is learning to be nimble and really looking at what brings the best return on your investment. So when I started the pen names, um, cause I write under a bunch of pen names for marketing reasons, cause you know, my, even though my young adult books are pretty clean, they're a little bit grittier. And a lot of the romance readers, some do read them, but most it's just not someone I'd market to. So they're all different names. Um, but when I started, I was like, okay, so what do I need for my pen name? I'll, I'll start a blog and I'll have Twitter and I'll have a Facebook page and I'll have a Facebook group. And, um, I did not do Instagram because Instagram's not my favorite, but I had all these things. And really quickly I was like, Twitter's a waste of time. I mean, uh, for my nonfiction stuff, you know, related to my podcast, I mean, I've got like 10,000 followers on Twitter. Has it ever sold me a book? No. And I have nonfiction books too. Like it just doesn't. So like, I know what Twitter's there for. It's more for authority or connecting um, and also becoming a mob and ganging up on people, which I'm not in favor <laughs> of. Um, but I really quickly stripped down, like what is the basic stuff that you need to actually, to sell books? Do I need a Facebook page? Yes, for ads, but do I need to work on growing my likes? No, I like that's just not something I worry about at all. And I know some people do and teach that you can, you know, do these lookalike audiences. That's fine. That is not my jam. And I don't have time because it takes a lot of work 
to grow a Facebook page, I would rather run ads and sell books than mm -hmm. grow my page. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather grow my group and I'd rather grow my email list because mm -hmm. the group is where people really get to connect with each other and you can be, okay. you know, show up and be personal. And then, you know, my email list, that's where your direct connection is. And so I've really stripped it way down. So then when I started the second um, pin name uh, for fiction uh, for the young adult, I was like, forget Twitter. I'll do the page just for ads. I mean, I don't even know. I might even have, not even have like a hundred likes, but I can run successful Facebook ads from that page. The group is pretty small too, but I focused on email and built a list pretty quickly of, you know, a couple thousand people. And the, the, I do, I did buy the .com um, for it, but it just goes to my mailer light landing page to sign up for my book. There's no website and that's fine. I'm still selling books. And so for me, the sustainability is you've got to look at the season that you're in, how much bandwidth do you have? And it's, it's hard to cut back on things. And so how many things do you want to start realistically? And so I really am big into asking what, what's the ROI, what's the res return on investment, not just for your money, but for your time, because right. none of us have a lot of time. So what, what is selling books? And to kind of back up from that question, what is helping me gain readers who are going to be raving fans because that sells books. And so those are the things I kind of focus on. And when I get these opportunities, I love new things. I love new things. I am, I am very quickly drawn into things, even though I know all this stuff. Um, and then I have to quit them or like, be like, that was a mistake. Um, but you know, I've tried to ask myself like, what is going to be the return on investment? Is this going to sell me books? Is this going to get me readers for the long haul? And if not, then I'm not doing it. And I don't care how many people are doing it. I don't care how shiny the object is. I just got to do that. Cause right now I don't have a lot of time. Right. So, yeah. Well, and another thing is you're really good at the new things. Like, you're good at it. So I can see the temptation there, it, but yeah, you've got to decide. Yeah. And there's an energy about starting new things, you know, and you don't want to miss like if there's a new social media platform, like there was one a couple of year, years ago called Ello. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I keep getting notifications. I'm like, Oh, that exists still. Like, still. Yeah. I guess I'm on there. People are liking some post I made four years ago. Um, and so the, you know, but, but if something took off, right, like you'd want to be there for it. So it is, it's hard to say no, but just trying to yeah. pick, pick and choose and make really smart decisions about what's going to get you the most bang for the buck or yeah. the bang for your time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So another question we have, and I've done this and I'm not, I'm kind of on the fence now about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but what the positive positives and negatives of sharing numbers like in Facebook groups and stuff. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So I just had a podcast episode recently about how to listen to success stories. Yeah. Um, and the podcast is creative writing. I forgot to mention that in the beginning, but, um, you know, I think here there are a couple dangers, right? Mm -hmm. The first is people aren't always honest and some, and, and I, and none of us would do this, right? We're all going to be honest with our numbers, but sometimes we don't always know the reasons for success. And if you've right. been around for a while, like I sometimes pick apart these success stories and we'll look and be like, Oh, this is interesting. They listed all this stuff. But then if you go look at their book, well, what they didn't mention is they're writing in one of those hot genres that like, or that is like flash in the pan. But if you put up a pre-order, you're going to get like 800 pre-orders right. without and even you share having a in a group and yeah. <clears throat> and people don't always share that and maybe they don't know it or maybe they, you know, whatever. I don't know. I can't say why people do what they do, but those success stories are, um, uh, uh, can be a little bit misleading. And so sometimes like, I just want to be aware, like, okay, am I, do I know why this was successful? And then, you know, last year I shared, um, you know, I had a, my January of last year was a $10,000 month for me almost. And that was really exciting coming. I'd, I hadn't even had a full year of novels out and I was really excited about that. And then my year like tanked, my income tanked and I was like, well, crap, everybody still probably thinks <laughs> yeah. I've got these $10,000 a month and that's not reality, but I don't, it's kind of embarrassing to share that it's not there. So um, I did eventually share and I'm honest about that. And this, you know, this January was not close to 10,000. It was like half the income, double the ads. And it's like, well, that sucks, but I'm going to be honest with that. So if you're going to be honest with the wins, it's a little deceptive if you're not also honest with the struggle. So that's for me, uh, you know, and not everybody feels that way. But for me, if you're going to share the wins, you got to share the lows too. Right. Um, and so that's important. And that's embarrassing. Sometimes like we don't, no one wants to, here's my failure story. I mean, you know, we do want to talk about mistakes but sort of frame them within like, I made this mistake and now I've turned it around. You're like, you're not going to go in your lowest point. <laughs> like, like, that sucks. I made a thousand dollars this month. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I think it can be dangerous. And also I've heard other authors say when they've shared those kinds of things that they sometimes suddenly have a rash of one star reviews on Goodreads or, um, you know, I know some authors who've shared like how quickly they were writing their books and then started getting reviews, like the authors writing too quickly. And you could tell that the people writing the reviews had been in those Facebook groups where those things were shared. And so I feel like, you know, we have to realize we're in the mob era of the internet. And so when you're sharing that stuff, you're giving people license to do with it what they will. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and so I think there is a danger in a lot of dangers. I think those success stories can be super helpful if they're very honest and share the good and bad and and really know why they were successful. Mm -hmm. Um, But the numbers, yeah, it can be a really scary thing. And I think, um, you know, a lot of bloggers used to share those income reports and have stopped because it it does start to get you attention you may not want as well. Right. Mm-hmm. And and one of the reasons I've sort of stopped is because I don't want to discourage anybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it can be discouraging because even though my numbers are great, when I see somebody else making greater numbers, I'm happy, but it is that tiny little bit of discouragement that honestly I don't need in my psyche right now. You know, it's just, it's not healthy. And so, um, yeah, so I, I'm with you and I posted in 20 books about my recent box set release, you know, what I was doing, everything. And I need to go back and update that because it hasn't been the win I thought it would be great, but those posts aren't near as fine or easy to write as the other ones are. So yeah, I've got to come up with the time to go in because I want to be honest with people, you know, and I think that's that's the other thing too. I didn't even mention the ad spend. A lot of times people share their numbers without sharing their ad spend. I see that all the time. Like, I made $20,000 this month spending 15,000 in ads. Nobody says that. And I'm like, oh, we're making the same amount. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that looked like this huge one. We're making the same amount. And I only spent thousand dollars now, you know? Right. So, um, uh, without all the pieces of information, it can be really hard. So, um, you know, those are important things. If you're someone reading all these success stories or the, the numbers, like you got to realize, like if they're not putting that in there, mm-hmm. that's an important key, um, yeah. to, to realize yeah. there's, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to take in and it's important to kind of make sure you're reading it with the right perspective because it can be really inspirational or it can be a downer at times. So you have to keep all that in mind. So, so you've already talked about um, some of the things that you thought were not a good use of your time, but um, is there anything else like maybe um, marketing or wise that you're just like, Oh, I'm just, I just look back on this thing and think I shouldn't have spent my time on that. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, group things for clean romance. It's just a Facebook group kind of giveaways and things where you're supposed to show up and parties. None of that has really panned out to mean anything. Um, that's not to say groups aren't helpful, but I think specifically clean romance, those readers are not, they might show up for them, but you don't see the kind of book sales that you hear other authors in other um, mm-hmm. spaces talking about. Um, <clears throat> but I totally also- understand that. Yeah. And it really probably, you know, varies by genre. There's probably some that it's fantastic and others it's not. Um, Also, I think some of the collaborations I've done with other authors have been a big waste of time. Um, And and I'd say that with the utmost respect to the people I've worked with, the best thing that has come out of those is relationships. Uh, But you know, there, there's, there were times last year, I, cause I was newer and I was like, not last year, I guess it was the year before, but times where I was like, okay, I need to join with these other people. Cause I'm getting my name out there and building my brand. And really my brand was doing fine on its own and taking that time took away from building my brand. It didn't help to get in front of their readers. It just slowed my own personal momentum to do like, you know, series where we're all each writing a book in a series. And those things absolutely can be helpful, but you need to really look at like what place am I in in my, you know, career and my journey, do I really need to have this group? Um, you know, one of them, it wasn't even that it was the the group itself because it was fantastic authors, but like we were, we had chosen kind of a trope that was not hot. And when my book came out, it sold like a third of what my other book the month before had sold in the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. And so I actually was like, you guys, I'm so sorry, but like, I'm pulling out. (laughs) I was the first book. So it didn't jack up like the series page or anything. I was like, within a week, I was like, I have to rebrand this book because this trope is not working. There's other tropes in it. And I'm totally, I changed the cover. Um, you know, it went from a bride book to a rock star book, mm-hmm. you know, and that focus saved it, but the launch still, you know, was not what it had been, but the book over the long haul has sold much better. 
Um, you know, and so just being really careful about the kind of collaborations that you're setting up, if they're going to be a really good use of your time and, and just, you know, building your, your brand, are they helping build your brand or are they taking away from time where you could be building your brand alone? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so have you had something that you thought or was a mistake or you made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Oh man. Um, that, I guess the, the one I just kind of mentioned, the collaboration turned out to be a good thing when I pulled out of it. Um, <laughs> so joining, um, you know, joining that group and, and some of the groups I, I have not seen the book sales, but have had really great relationships with people after. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually ended up with a great book. And so I think, you know, when you being able to kind of like, talking about being nimble, like being able to rebrand a book and still use like, okay, I have this whole book. That's a good book. And I'm going to take it out of here and use it somewhere else. I may not have written that book, you know, had it not been for that group. And now I've actually built a series around that. And that's what's, you know, selling the best for me right now. And so, um, I think we have to kind of think out of the box. We have to be able to, um, figure out how to turn things around. And the nice thing about indies is we can be nimble. We don't have a publisher saying, well, we need to do this and that. Oh, oh, we can't do this until there's another print run. We can say, it's been a week. This isn't working. I'm buying a new cover this afternoon mm-hmm. and I'm getting this book rebranded today. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was able to do that, but but I still think it was a mistake to do the collaboration. Um, and But so I don't think I have any where I'm like, this is a mistake. And then it turned out to be great. Like I was able to turn it into something better, right. but I don't, I haven't had any mistakes yet that I was like, I'm not sure about this. And then it turned out to be awesome. Okay. Usually it's the opposite way. Like this is going to be great. Oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> well, um, so what changes have you seen um, in your genre or over the course of your author career, which writing in this genre, it's just been a couple of weeks, I mean, a couple of years, but yeah. you know, have you seen changes already? I absolutely have depressing changes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I feel like since I've started, like I was able to make way more money in 2018 with less ads. Yeah. And now to make the same amount of money. So we're not talking about keeping, I'm talking about like the, the, I always forget the gross and net, which are the gross is the same, but I'm spending more in ads. So like my, I'm bringing yeah. home less, which is really frustrating. I'm like, my platform is bigger. My writing is better. I'm more well-established. You'd think it would just go up, but that's not necessarily the case. And also clean romance really was a fairly newer, I mean, not that those books were new, but the category in Amazon was pretty new, the clean and wholesome category. And so as time has gone on and as more people were talking about their success in that space, it became a lot more crowded. So like if you've been writing it in some ways, it was a more, you know, new genre and I got in more on the new side of things and then took kind of a little breather at the wrong time. And so (laughs) when I was like, okay, I'm done with my breather. Let's come back to this. I'm like, Oh, it's a lot more crowded in here now. Um, And then I started seeing like people were asking in some of these groups that have a lot of these writers, uh, what, you know, what are you going to change in 2020? And a lot of people are like, I, I quit my job and now I'm going back to it because they yeah. were finding the same things that sales were down. The space was a lot more crowded. So for me, I'm kind of like, well, I'm here for the long haul. So like, bye, you know, <laughs> I'm so sorry it didn't work, but like, I'm still going to show up. Yeah. And that might help as, as some people realize this is not the cash cow. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people kind of jumped in like, oh, there's a lot of money to be made. I'll just churn out books. And I can write quickly, but I think, you know, in this space, uh, my, my literary novels or, you know, the people that I kind of trained up with and that would be like, these are good books. What? But like in the space, I would say like, they're, they're good books in that space. Um, you know, and where there was a lot of things that just were being thrown together. So I can do that quickly. Um, but not everybody can. And so I think the kind of waiting it out, but I have seen the ad spend increase. I've also seen, you know, there was a really hot trope. Billionaires were super hot and clean. Um, and they're not now, but nothing new has come in. That's the hot trope. And, you know, again, when I published my first billionaire book, the sales within three weeks were like three times what I'd made in three months with other books that definitely were hitting the genre pretty well. So, you know, that's the power of those hot things. If you can capitalize and write quickly enough on a hot thing, but there's no hot thing that's replaced that. So billionaires are on the decline. I mean, they're still selling well, but, um, 
not as well as they were. And a lot more com- people are complaining because that's what happens when you have a hot trend is that yeah. everybody dumps on it. And I'm like, well, you're, somebody is still buying these books. <laughs> yeah. You can complain about it all you want, but somebody is still buying them. Um, but yeah, nothing's really risen up to, to take the place of that. And so I think that that matters because you just have a lot, those, it, again, if you can get in on them, they really can sell a lot of books, but you also have to make sure that your book is going to stand the test of time after that's over. So like, is your book going to look really dated because it's a billionaire book or, uh, you know, whatever last year it was like the bully romance and, in a lot of not in clean, but in some other genres and I saw those everywhere. And now those are kind of on the decline. Um, so those are some of the changes. It's just a lot more crowded, a lot more ads and there's right, you know, specifically in ours, there's not really a hot trend at the moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're certainly not alone. I mean, that you're not the only person I've heard that from, that people are writing more books, they have more books out, and they're doing more, spending more, and making less. And so, you know, things have changed. And um, I, I mean, I don't know that it's a bad thing if it becomes harder in some ways, because people who are just kind of playing around just because it may they may think it's a good way to make some money, maybe they'll move on. And like you, I'm in for the long haul. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success in your author career? If you could narrow it down to maybe a couple of things. Oh man. Okay. So I think the first thing I'm, I'm always a huge proponent of email. And so growing my email list, like having that be my main and first focus. Um, I think that has, you know, even though like, don't you wish like, do, like I do, like that, that all the 6,000 people on my list would go buy my book yeah. on the day of the launch. Don't you wish that was how email worked? Um, and they don't, spoiler alert, they're not going to. And so some people are like, what's the point? Well, the point is it still sells better than anything else. I mean, other than perhaps ads, but in terms of like the connection that you have with mm-hmm. people, it's the only place you have a direct connection with people and it lasts, right? Like that, that's something lasting. Like if Facebook goes away tomorrow. We've all got to regroup in a big way, but you still have your email list. And so that has been a big thing. And I have seen, um, that really be helpful, but I, I feel like just continuing to read and continue to write and love what you do. And, um, so I feel like for me, it's, I've really fallen in love. You know, I started out kind of like, okay, I need to make money. This genre is making money. That's why I started writing in the genre I did. And I didn't love it. I didn't love the books, hadn't read enough. And then I fell in love with it. So I have my own love story with clean romance, <laughs> like story arc, you know, um, we haven't, maybe this year was our dark moment with my sales, but um, <laughs> I think so that means it's going to get better. <laughs> let's hope so. Right. We're going to go to the happy ending and the epilogue yeah. is just going to be forever of me making billions of dollars. But um, yeah, I think for me, making sure that I, I love what I'm doing as well. And so, you know, I'm not you know, our circumstances financially are, are a little different now. And so I'm not doing it for the same reasons I was. So I can be a little bit more like, oh, well, I didn't make as much money this month. Like mentally that stinks. Like I'm always comparing myself to myself. Like I always want to see myself doing better. And my husband has to be like, do you realize like you made this much money this month? You sold this many books. And I'm like, thank you for being that reminder because sometimes I'm just really hard on myself. Um, but continuing to just love what I do and and continue to read and enjoy uh, the the things I'm learning and knowing that I don't know everything. I mean, that's just such a huge thing is, is not getting to a point where you think I've got this because something's going to change, you know, social media platform, the ad platform, Mm -hmm. something will change. Um, There'll be a disruption in eBooks. You know, it could be any number of those things, but, but being able to kind of be flexible with those things and, and kind of really dig in, I think is, is important. And knowing I've always got stuff I can learn. I always have things I can learn. And so, mm-hmm. you know, going to like the mastermind with Jamie, where I don't know the terms and feel like an idiot, you know, publishing books. I'm like, I don't, am I supposed to know what my characters want? Like, is that a thing I'm supposed to know <laughs> as I go into the book? Um, you know, just, just being open to, to that learning process and being able to, to change and not getting stuck because as indies, that is, you know, you, you're not, you're going to be in trouble. Like, and you see those people who are in trouble who are like, well, I started publishing in 2014 and I don't understand why I can't sell books now. It's like, well, you're trying to do the same thing that worked in 2014 and it doesn't. Cause I had a nonfiction book out in 2014 and did the whole, or 2013, the whole free book. And then all of a sudden your rank, when you go back to paid is like, you know, huge in the store and sold 10,000 copies without any kind of advertising or even promoting it, you know, things like that, which don't happen now. 
Yeah, those were um, the good old days. <laughs> they were, they were, but we're all a lot smarter now. So that's the benefit. Like we can be smarter and sell less books. I don't know. Um, maybe that's, <laughs> that's not great, but yeah. So being nimble and continuing to love what you do and staying kind of fresh with what's what's happening, I guess. And and to your point about email, your newsletter list, I never send out an email that I don't get a bump in sales. Yeah. On my own books. I mean, and, and so yes, all, you know, 8,000 people, whatever I have on there now, I can't even remember, but they, they don't buy my book at one time, but they do trickle in and buy. So yeah, it's the best you, you have to have contact with those people and have a way to reach them. So, well, tell us how, uh, tell our listeners how people can find you. Kirsten. Okay. Well, I've got a lot of places, but the best one probably is to, uh, because this is a podcast for writers to head over to create if writing, not creative, but create if writing.com. And that's where I've got the podcast and links to the community and um, a lot of things like that, that are just resources for authors as well. Um, probably my pen names are mentioned on there somewhere, but you know, if you're a reader of one of those, you'll, you'll be able to dig around and find them. Um, and can they sign up for your email list that way? Yes, uh, absolutely. Nonfiction. That's a great email. I love getting your emails. Yeah. I just send a quick email every Friday. I try to do some like industry news, um, tips, resources, things like that, but not long. It's called the quick fix. So that's short. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Well, thanks for being here. It's been tons of fun. Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys for having me. I always like talking to other writers and oh, yeah, that's really why we did this podcast. <laughs> just to talk to other writers. Yeah. 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 So thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me and congrats on the launch of your podcast. It's great. Thank and I'm you. Glad to be here. Thank we'll you. We'll see you next week on Wish I'd Known Then for writers. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.